How should I live my life? And am I living the best life that I can? These are questions we have all asked ourselves. And my insights into these questions are based on the privilege I have had of teaching students around the world. And they tell me that in studying material like literature, history, philosophy, religion, that they have become better people. And so by observing in them this inspiring transformation, awareness, awakening, this is what I have learned as the following 10 insights into how we can each become better people. Travel. Visit another part of your city, your state, your province, your territory, another part of your country, another country, another continent. Appreciate all the million ways of looking at life and the world and place yourself outside of your comfort zone. Learn another language. The philosopher Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Each language looks at the world uniquely. So when we speak different languages, we become different people. An example I like to give, if you would like to learn another language, find a boyfriend or a girlfriend <laughs> who is a native speaker of that language, but who, crucially, does not speak a word of your language. <laughs> Read the news. Read the news on a daily basis throughout the day from sources around the world, from sources on all sides of the political spectrum about the same issue, event, idea, and or topic. Read great literature and great history. Studies have demonstrated that reading literature increases our IQ, and also increases our emotional intelligence. It is no accident that in the 18th century, in Western Europe, we see the rise of human rights at the same time and place that we see the development of the novel form. What both human rights and the novel enable us to do is to imagine lives that are radically different from our own, maybe to empathize with those lives, to feel what that person is feeling, to recognize and accept that there is no person and no group in this world who is lesser or greater, who has a lesser quantity of humanity or a greater quantity of humanity than anybody else. And when we can feel what that person is feeling, when we can place ourselves inside their shoes of that person that enriches us and it empowers our ability to help that person. Reading history, reading great history teaches us where we come from and where other people come from. We are each the products of history, that history is alive and we carry the history of our history to each and every interaction and so do other people. Knowing where we come from, knowing where other people come from, helps us understand why we and they act and react in the ways that they do and that we do. Reading literature and history cultivates our humanity. They teach us reverence for each and every single human life. They teach us that each person takes their life just as seriously as we do, as you do, as you do, and as you do. The Indian word, the Indian greeting, namaste, means I bow to the divinity within you. Place yourself in a situation 
where you become the majority or the minority. This can be on the basis of many identities, such as ethnicity, race, gender, sexuality, language, accent, nationality, class, religion, caste, ability, disability. Observe how the narrative changes, because it will. Privileges might be given to you, privileges might be taken away. What you took to be normal, natural, in some cases, common sense, reveals itself to be cultural, social, habitual, in some cases, ideological, and connected to a deeply embedded system of power that for its operation requires that we do not question it and that we do not speak about it, but through its silent operation lessens each of our humanity. Listen more than you speak. Listening very well, listening actively, allows us to truly understand other people, almost literally to begin seeing other people. It increases our skills in being able to closely analyze and observe and perceive all of the nuances of social interactions. Listening very well helps us have a reverence for the power of each spoken word, so that we choose and use each word very carefully, almost as if each word were a physical object. And this wise choice, this wise usage shows us that freedom of speech is not freedom of incivility. Who better to teach us the power of the spoken word than the 30th President of the United States? President Calvin Coolidge was also known as Silent Cal. There is an anecdote that allegedly, at a dinner party, a woman turned to President Coolidge and said, Mr. President, I made a bet with a friend this evening that I could make you say more than three words. President Coolidge turned to the woman, looked at her, and said, you lose. <laughs> and he remained silent the rest of the evening. That's the important part. Having said that, we must absolutely speak up and speak out. We must speak up and speak out when we have something important to say. We must speak up and speak out when we observe inequality, injustice, unfairness, wrongdoing. We must see an injustice committed against somebody else as an injustice committed against us and against humanity. We all know the expression that evil requires good people like you and me to do nothing and say nothing. And silence, in one sense, is violence. It might be difficult speaking out, speaking up, but if we prioritize emotional comfort, not at the cost of, but over the truth, then we hinder the process of education for everyone. It might be difficult, but other people are probably thinking the same thing that you are thinking. 
so many of the revolutions of history that have given us the rights and freedoms and privileges and opportunities that each one of us today enjoys began and were made possible because somebody stood up, stood out, spoke up, and spoke out. It takes courage, but it also develops courage. And it develops leadership so that people want to be led by us. So we must never forget, and you must never forget, the power of your inner revolutionary. And never forget the power of one. See yourself as a citizen of the world. If you are ever feeling sad, anxious, depressed, lonely, overworked, stressed, sleepless, afraid, and we all do. These are all very common. Make a list to yourself of the things for which you are grateful. And there's something for which we can each be grateful, the gift of life itself. And after you make this list, ask yourself, how would this list be different if I were based in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia? Because it would. Studies have demonstrated that this simple act of making this list increases our health, our happiness, and our overall well-being. Adopt a practice that gives you quiet time with yourself. Adopt a practice that allows you to look within, that allows you to introspect. Some people like to do yoga. Some people like to meditate. Some people like to read. Some people like to write. Some people like to walk. Some people like to run. And a lot of people like to sleep. But that doesn't count. <laughs> Adopt a practice that gives you the chance to become aware of your thoughts, that makes you aware of the physical sensations of your body, and what this will do is develop a stillness, a calmness, and a deep, quiet confidence, and a deep, quiet trust in yourself so that you can fully engage with whatever life presents to you. Lastly, always ask how can I help other people? What can I do to serve and then take that action? Moving from the me to the we increases our gratitude for life. It shows us that each of our successes is always enabled by other people and by our community. So in turn, we must build up other people, build up our communities. Empathy can be powerful. But empathy is not justice. And guilt is not justice. Justice is justice. The work is difficult, but we must always absolutely believe in our capability, capacity, ability, goodness, and power to achieve it. The Buddha said, believe nothing I say unless you see it to be true in your own life. Eleanor Roosevelt said that courage is more exhilarating than fear, and in the long run, it is easier. Gandhi taught us that for an entire nation to become free, we as individuals must learn to free ourselves so that self-rule, self-mastery, self-awareness, and self-respect become the engines that drive and produce the strength and freedom of the nation. 
Aristotle. Aristotle said that justice is the highest virtue. So if you are compelled by the vision of becoming the most virtuous person that you can be, if you are inspired to become the best person that you can be, and if you are motivated to live the best life that you can live, not for the sake of self-interest or the temptations of power and privilege, but for the far more worthwhile, lasting, fulfilling, goal of a great society, a just society, a good society filled with love, happiness, peace, acceptance, opportunity, and respect for everyone, then I invite you. I invite you to reflect upon these insights and start taking that action, start putting into motion that transformation starting right here, right now.